Understanding Kinematic Alignment of the Knee. This is Dr. Jean Dossett. In this talk, I'd like to consider several points. First of all, why consider changing our alignment strategy and total knee replacement? What is the science behind kinematic alignment? What is the current state of the art for kinematic alignment? And finally, I'd like to look at some future direction for kinematic alignment. Well, the simple answer to why consider changing our method of alignment has to do with patient satisfaction. Multiple studies have shown satisfaction rates from total knee replacement are, are only around 80%. Here are three studies, anywhere from 80 to 82 percent satisfaction. Different techniques and implants similarly have not shown improvement. These are randomized controlled trials of four different methods and alignment uh, techniques and we did not see any improvement in our clinical results. Perhaps the alignment method shared by these techniques contributes to the dissatisfaction seen in some of the post-op patients. When we align tibial and femoral components, there are six degrees of freedom for each component. Flexion extension, varus valgus, internal external rotation, and then there are six translations for each of those components, medial lateral, anterior posterior, proximal distal. There are literally thousands of possible combinations. When we look at alignment methods, we have mechanical alignment, which is our current widely accepted method, this is a fixed target, 90 degrees to the coronal mechanical axis, specifically for the femur and the tibia. Anatomic alignment, which is a fixed target based on mean alignment values, which tend to be 2 to 3 degrees increased femoral valgus and tibial varus from a mechanical axis target. And finally, we have kinematic alignment, where the target varies for each patient based on anatomy. The difference between kinematic alignment and mechanical or anatomic alignment is that the target varies rather than being fixed. Kinematic alignment is an emerging technology. What led up to kinematic alignment? Biomechanical engineering studies, especially those about the cylindrical axis, anatomic studies of limb alignment, femoral anatomy, 3D imaging, especially imaging in a non-orthogonal plane, which is imaging in a plane that's oblique to our standard coronal, sagittal, or axial views. Computer planning of surgical procedures, including inputting MRI data, inputting CT data, planning all bone cuts for the total knee arthroplasty, and then linking the computer planning to rapid prototype manufacturing. This basically is 3D printing based on the computer planning. This type of manufacturing is now becoming available for 2D images as well. Biomechanical research. In 1996, Dr. Eckhoff received the Ranawat Award from the Knee Society for a talk entitled Morphology of the Distal Femur and Femoral Component Rotation. He then published this in 2005 in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in an article entitled Three-Dimensional Mechanics kinematics and morphology of the knee viewed in virtual reality. In this paper, Dr. Eckhoff noted that a cylinder can fit the bony surface of the distal femur and this can lead us to the single axis that defines the center of the cylinder and leads us to a single axis of rotation for the femur. We can use non-orthogonal imaging to help us find the cylinder and find the axis of rotation of the femur. Dr. Howell in 2010 studied the radii of the medial and lateral femoral condyles in both varus and valgus knees with osteoarthritis. And he found that the asymmetry between the medial and lateral femoral condyles was less than 0.2 millimeters, which is small enough to be considered clinically unimportant for lining a total knee prosthesis. This is a picture from the Otis Med Corporation that details the axes of rotation of the knee. So the green line is a transverse axis about which the tibia flexes and extends. The purple line is a transverse axis about which the patella flexes and extends. 
and the yellow line is a longitudinal axis about which the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur and this is at 90 degrees to the tibia and the patella axis. Imaging studies. Dr. Eckhoff performed CT scans on college students with non-arthritic knees. What could be seen is that there is a broad variety, a broad range of angular alignments for the limb. There's a bell-shaped curve centered at zero, but for normal subjects we can see var varus and valgus knees that are over 15 degrees of angulation in terms of limb alignment. There are imaging studies that have helped us understand knee alignment. In a recent article entitled, Hip Knee Ankle Radiographs Are More Appropriate for Assessment of Postoperative Mechanical Alignment of Total Knee Arthroplasties Than Standard AP Knee Radiographs, showed us that we need to use longer standing films to try to make an assessment of what the alignment is postoperatively for our patients. And if we take just a smaller segment of that longer x-ray, we can be misled in terms of the alignment. An important consideration is that the lower extremity is actually three degrees varus from the vertical. So a line that is from the center of the symphysis pubis to the floor at 90 degrees to the floor actually shows departure of about three degrees varus for the left and right limbs when we measure the alignment of the limb. This concept was looked at recently by a group from Canada when they looked at functional joint line obliquity after kinematic total knee arthroplasty. Their conclusion was that when we took a look at the tibia, 33 tibial components may have been considered risk outliers oriented in more than three degrees of varus or valgus. However, when the patient was considered in terms of the vertical, or in other words, they looked at the floor and they went to see when the limb was loaded what the alignment was, only six of the knees were outside of that range. If we go back 30 years to the work of Hungerford and Krakow, we see a similar concept where they looked at patients in two-legged stance with the ankles together, simulating the position of the limbs in single leg stance and a varus tibial cut in this particular position shows that the joint line is horizontal. Dr. Bellamins in 2011 took a look at neutral mechanical alignment and asked is that normal for all patients. He also received the Ranawat Award at the Knee Society for this paper. There were several very important findings in this paper. The first is that the hip knee ankle angle is in varus for the 500 patients that he studied, more so in men than women. And then if varus and valgus knees are broken down for both men and women, significant differences in the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and the medial proximal tibial angle exist. So when we take a look at kinematic alignment, there's a paradigm shift in our way of thinking, and some of this is controversial. So the first is the concept, do we have hypoplastic lateral femoral condyles that we commonly encounter when we do our total knee replacements? So the term hypoplastic means incomplete or underdeveloped tissue or an organ. And the answer to that is no, we do not commonly have hypoplastic lateral condyles. The mechanical distal lateral femoral angle is in valgus in relation to the mechanical axis of the femur. So the radius of the medial lateral condyles, as Dr. Howell showed, are within 0.2 millimeters of each other. So let's take a look at a patient with 8.5 degrees of limb valgus. If we cut this femur at 90 degrees to the mechanical axis of the femur, what we see is that there's a substantial cut on the medial distal femoral condyle and a very thin lateral distal cut. And this is because of the anatomy of this patient. So what we see is that the lateral distal femoral angle is actually 5.4 degrees. 
So if we cut it at 90 degrees, there's an additional 5.4 degrees of valgus that this patient has in his or her normal anatomy. The condyle is not hypoplastic. It simply is in a different plane than what we're used to imaging and what we're used to uh, cutting at 90 degrees. Another controversy is, should the posterior cuts be aligned to the epicondylar axis? And the answer is no. The knee axis is not parallel to the epicondylar axis. The femoral axis is not parallel to the epicondylar axis. And the femoral axis is parallel to the posterior condylar axis. Should we routinely perform ligament releases? The answer is no. With mechanical alignment, non-anatomic bone cuts can require release of normal ligaments to make up for these cuts. In a kinematically aligned knee, we do not need to do ligament releases. So the details of kinematic alignment. What is kinematically aligned is the femur. We need to identify how thick the femoral prosthesis is distally and posteriorly. For example, the prosthesis I use is 9 millimeters thick. Now, if we had a knee that was not arthritic, the distal cut, which would include bone and cartilage, would be 9 millimeters thick to match the articular thickness of the implant. The posterior cuts would be 9 millimeters, posterior medial, posterior lateral. And there would not be external rotation as the normal knee, with no wear, is aligned parallel to the posterior condylar axis. In a knee with arthritis, we need a way to determine the femoral wear and subtract this from the bone and cartilage that's cut. So we can use a non-orthogonal MRI to help us determine the wear distally and posteriorly. For each of my patients, preoperatively, we have a sequence for an MRI to plan a patient-specific guide, and then we switch to a different sequence, which is a non-orthogonal view, and the radiologist reports out the thickness of the cartilage present at zero degrees, which is our distal cut, and 90 degrees at our posterior cut. So this concept was used by Dennis Nam in a paper that was published, which showed that the femoral and bone Femoral bone and cartilage wear is predictable at 0 and 90 degrees in the osteoarthritic knee treated with total knee arthroplasty. What these authors found was that femoral bone wear greater than 1 millimeter was only about 0.6% in the varus knees, and in the valgus knees they looked at, they did not find any bone wear. So the details of kinematic alignment. In the arthritic knee, the femur is what is kinematically aligned. The tibia is matched to the femur by one of two techniques, either computer planning or gap balancing. In 2005, there was a clinical application of kinematic alignment, and a company was formed called Otis Met. Charlie Chi was the CEO, he was an engineer. Ben Park was an engineer, and Steve Howell was an orthopedic surgeon who was the medical director. Otis Med had two innovative concepts. The first was patient-specific guides that were commercially available, and the second was kinematic alignment. The company was acquired in 2009 by Stryker. Otis Med used a non-orthogonal MRI of the knee and determined the femoral position and then calculated the tibial wear, matched the tibial component to the femoral component. The mechanical axis was not referenced for any of the knees. And the controversy is that some limb and implant alignments can go outside of three degrees, and some people have a concern whether this will cause long-term failures. Well, we studied this technique at our institution, and in a randomized controlled trial, we looked at kinematically and mechanically aligned total knee arthroplasty, and we observed our two-year results and published uh, in July of 2014. So kinematic alignment individualizes each patient's knee alignment, restores the axis of rotation of each patient's knee. When we looked at our results, comparing the two groups, the hip knee ankle angle for both our kinematically aligned and mechanically aligned group was very close to a straight line. There was no significant difference between the two groups in terms of the limb alignment. The knee alignment 
was similarly very close between the two groups and there was no statistical difference. What was different was the implant alignment. The kinematically aligned group showed 2.2 degrees more valgus of the femoral component and the mean tibial component was 2.1 degrees more varus. So the radiograph on the right shows a straight line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle and if you look at the components the tibia has two degrees of varus, the femur has two degrees of valgus, and in this particular patient this very closely matches the non-operative left leg. Well our clinical results of two years showed all outcomes were better for the kinematically aligned group. The Oxford knee score was better. The combined knee society score was better. Flexion was eight degrees better with the same cruciate retaining prosthesis. The Womack score was better. This is a scatter plot that shows the Oxford knee scores for all of the patients in our study at two years. Several things can be noted on this plot. On the right is mechanical alignment. There's a wide distribution of scores. 48 is the best score, 0 is the worst score. The red box has a red line that's a horizontal line across the middle of the box. This is the median score. Half of the patients are above, half of the patient scores are below this line. If we look at kinematic alignment, that red line is almost at 45, with half of the patients being above that, that score. Now, not all of the patients had a perfect score with kinematic alignment. You can see four points that are lower points on this scale. However, there were few fewer patients that had lower scores in the kinematically aligned group compared to the mechanical alignment group. Now the most important finding of our study occurred when we looked at the patients who were actually pain-free at two years. Both the Womack and the Oxford knee score have questions related to pain and we took a look at the patients who had perfect scores. What we found was that with the Oxford knee score, patients were 2.4 times more likely to be pain-free at two years with the kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty. Looking at the Womack pain questions, the patients were 3.8 times more likely to be pain-free at two years with the kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty. Discussion. Although mechanical alignment is a long-standing and widely accepted principle of total knee replacement surgery, this level one study shows that an alignment technique based on restoring the prearthritic kinematics for each patient's particular knee can produce significantly better results at two years with regard to pain, function, and motion as compared to mechanical alignment. Our study was published in the Bone and Joint Journal in July of 2014. The entire data set was submitted and statistically analyzed by the journal prior to publication. This year there was a study by Dr. Howell that showed his cases have survivorship at six years of 97.5 percent. Well what's the current state of the art? At this point I have to quote Murphy's Law that says anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Otis Med failed to obtain proper FDA clearance for their technique. Manufacturing and shipping was halted in 2009 by the FDA and this company is no longer in business. The CEO of the company organized the shipping of about 200 guides after the cease and desist order from the FDA and this led to the US Attorney's Office in New Jersey prosecuting both the company and the CEO and the corporation was required to pay more than 80 million dollars in fines and the CEO is facing up to three years in jail and $300,000 fine. So what is the current state of art of the art for kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty? Kinematic alignment can be performed with patient specific guides, conventional instruments, modified conventional instruments, or computer navigation. The key is to understand the principles behind kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty. 
We still need to have a technique that aligns the tibia and is standardized across these different platforms. And further research is needed. Kinematic alignment needs to be tracked with registry data to look at the longevity of the implants. The Otis Med alignment can be approximated with modified conventional instruments. These are currently available from Zimmer. They're designed by Stephen Howell, MD. The tibia is gap balanced to match the femur and alignment outside of three degrees of the mechanical axis for the limb or the implant can occur. How do we teach kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty? We need one to two day courses to begin teaching this alignment method. We at first need to go through the principles, the indications, the planning of these cases, and how to handle patients who have extremes of implant or limb alignment. We need to look at the operative technique, have quality control, interoperative adjustments, and postoperatively we need to teach how to rotationally control a postoperative CT scan to assess the alignment results of the technique. We need outcome studies both in the short term and the long term. And finally we need process improvement based on these outcomes. Thank you.